Good morning. Good morning. How are you guys? Good. Good. Grab your Bibles to the book of Revelation. Revelation. Revelation chapter 1. We have been in a teaching series, I think it's been since late January, early February, week by week, month by month, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, going through the book of Revelation together, and we've been focusing our time in the first five chapters. And today, we're rounding out this series, finishing this series entitled what? Man, you got to say it like you believe it. Jesus loves church. Jesus loves church. Now, who's the church? Us. Us. Yeah, Jesus loves his people. Loves his people. It's been a phenomenal study in this book with this theme and with this focus that Jesus loves his people. Now, how many of you guys, we'll just see, we'll just take a poll. How many of you guys got a chance to come to church last Sunday in the midst of that hurricane that was last Sunday? Okay. Last Sunday was gnarly. It was crazy. Uh, I was talking to some of the people at the table, and they said, there's a lake in front of the house in which we're staying. I was like, yeah, we got a lot of rain over the week. Um, Thankful that it cleared this weekend. Um, The band was here this weekend to play on the beach for the Family Beach Fest. Thank you guys for doing that. Heard it was a great event. Um, But this morning, with having the team that's here to lead us in worship. And as we're closing out this series, Jesus Loves Church, last Sunday, Pastor John covered chapter five in its entirety. So if you go, well, we've done one through five. So what are we doing today? We're gonna do chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, chapter four, and chapter five. I love how the guy who was leading us this morning said, we just wanna pray that we take a deep dive. I was like, that's awesome, because we're gonna cover five chapters in 20 minutes. Say, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? Well, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, let me just read this to you. This is an encouragement coming from a seasoned pastor to someone who is up and coming in ministry. Younger. In fact, in this chapter, Paul's writing to Timothy because he was navigating this challenge, perhaps, that either he was timid because of his age and experience, Or he was receiving perhaps some kind of obstinance to his age. He encourages him, hey, let no no one despise your youth, but be an example. Be an example. Let your life preach. And then he gave this simple exhortation to Timothy in the fourth chapter of the book that's known as 1 Timothy in verse 13. I want to read this from the New Living Translation. This is what he writes to Timothy. He says, Focus on reading the scriptures to the church, encouraging the believers and teaching them. Focus on reading, the public reading of God's word to God's people. You know, one of the things that I can miss sometimes as someone who gives messages from God's word, who teaches the Bible, is that oftentimes when the letters were written to the church, They were read in one sitting and one setting where you're able to absorb. Well, what's the what's the theme of what the author is writing? See, as we consider chapter one through five in the book of Revelation, here's what I believe you would see and sense as you hear it read to you. Jesus loves his people. He loves his church. And that's what we've been learning together over the last few months. In fact, we're going to share a little a website link with you on the screen in just a moment. Actually, just put it up right now. You've seen this before week over week. This coastlinegolfbreeze.com, Revelation 2022. Well, we updated it this week with some fresh content. So let's go to that next slide and we'll see that this week we added all the teaching notes, the sermons, and the two-minute devotionals that go through all the chapters of the book of Revelation. This page includes sermon notes, small group discussion questions, the YouTube, the the Spotify audio, we've done everything we know to do to equip the church to know that Jesus loves them. I love that. Because when you know who you are, then you know what to do. Only then. And I grew up with this phrase that I believe 110%. It's more about relationship than what? Religion, yeah. That in our experience with the Lord, it's more about a relationship with Jesus than it is a religion about Jesus. But there's a statement there that I think that helps the qualifying element of that relationship. Say, what do you mean? It's about a love 
relationship with Jesus. Because you can have a relationship with Jesus that's altogether formal, distant, mechanical, routine. A.W. Tozer, a great author, once wrote a book, said, Rut, Rot, or Revival. Those are your options. And I'll be honest with you. You know when I slip into rut, which eventually turns to rot, is when I forget that the reason Jesus took those nails and died on that cross was for a love relationship with us. Where he could make a way so that we could be with him. Knowing him personally. Hearing his voice. Having a relationship with him where we are forgiven, set free. Part of a family and our future is bright. We're headed to heaven. So today, here's what we're going to do. We're going to focus most of our time just in worship of Jesus. We've done that this morning a little bit. We'll do it again in just a few moments. But before we do that, I want to do what Paul encouraged Timothy to do. To, to focus on just simply reading the scriptures to you. We're excited next Sunday starts a series for us that we're entitling Summer at Coastline. Very, very brilliant marketing, right? Summer at Coastline. <laughs> I love it though. I love how simple it is. And we've got a wonderful array of guest teachers from our local area who are coming just to bring God's word. We're going to step out of the book of Revelation in June and July. And then in August, we'll step back into it and look at chapters 6 through 19, where we see how God truly, through his love for humanity, is 100% love and also 100% just. He judges sin. We'll walk through that, Lord willing, throughout the fall. But for this morning, as we close our series, I want to give attention to to the public reading of God's word and just pray over our congregation. So Revelation chapter one, if you're there, let me know by saying Jesus loves church. Jesus loves church. Jesus loves church. Let me read to you the entirety of Revelation chapter one. This is what it says. This is a revelation from Jesus Christ which God gave him to show his servants the events that soon must take place. He sent an angel to present this revelation to his servant John, who faithfully reported everything he saw. This is his report of the word of God, the testimony of Jesus Christ. God blesses, listen to this verse. God blesses the one who reads the words of this prophecy to the church, and he blesses all who listen to its message and obey what it says. For the time is near. This letter is from John to the seven churches in the province of Asia. Grace and peace to you from the one who is, who always was, and who is still to come. From the sevenfold spirit before his throne. And from Jesus Christ. He is the faithful witness to these things, the first to rise from the dead. Listen to this phrase. The ruler of all the kings of the world. All glory to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by shedding his blood for us. He has made us a kingdom of priests of God, for God, his father. All glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. Look. He comes with the clouds of heaven, and everyone will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the nations of the world will mourn for him. Yes, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord God. I am the one who is, who always was, and is, who is still to come, the Almighty One. Now I, John, am your brother and your partner in suffering and in God's kingdom and in patient endurance in which Jesus calls us. I was exiled to the island of Patmos for preaching the word of God and for my testimony about Jesus. It was the Lord's day and I was worshiping in the spirit and suddenly I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet blast and it said, write in a book everything you see. Send it to the seven churches in the cities of Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. When I turned to see who was speaking to me, I saw seven gold lampstands. 
And standing in the middle of the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man, and he was wearing a long robe with a gold sash across his chest. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow. And his eyes, his eyes were like flames of fire. His feet like polished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice thundered like many mighty ocean waves. He held seven stars in his right hand, and a sharp two-edged sword came out of his mouth. And his face was like the sun in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as if I were dead. But he laid his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I'm the living one. I died. But look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and the grave. Write down what you have seen, both the things that are now happening and the things that will happen. This is the meaning of the mystery of the seven stars you saw in my right hand and the seven gold lampstands. The seven stars are the seven angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. God blesses those who read this and do what it says. That's verse 3. Billy Graham, you've heard me say this often, said that the, the most often committed sin in America is simply listening to a sermon. See, we've spent the last few months deep diving into this text. If you want to know what are these lampstands, what are, dive into that text with us through all that content that's available online. But just listen to this simple reading of God's word today. It simply says this to us in Revelation chapter 1. Blessed is the one who reads what's in this book and simply does it. And did you catch the descriptions of who Jesus is in verses 5, verses 8, and verses 13 through 16? Jesus came as a humble servant to die on a cross, to die our death so we might live his life. He rose again broke the power of sin, paid for the penalty that sin brings upon us all. And one day we will be in his presence, seeing him as he is. See, Revelation chapter one is simply the description, the person of Jesus. Pop quiz. Amazing or lame? This side, what do you think? Amazing. 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 Astounding or boring? Astounding. Astounding. He's brilliant. His feet are like polished bronze, revined in the furnace. His voice thunders like mighty oceans. See, here's what I want to do as we just finish the first reading this morning. I want you to know that as it says in Revelation chapter 1, that he loves you. He loves you, and he is the one who has all authority and power. The one who can make everything right. The one who sees the end from the beginning and the beginning to the end. He knows you. He's called you. He's redeemed you. He's made you his kid. It's about relationship, not religion. It's about a love relationship with Jesus. I want to ask you to stand with me this morning. And I just want to pray that you would... Know this Lord who is resurrected in authority and power. And at this time also as I pray, I just want to invite the men forward who are going to come and read the next two chapters for us. Father, I pray for Coastline Gulf Breeze. I thank you so much for this church. God, I ask as we've spent time together in your word week by week unpacking these scriptures that Lord, our church would not miss who you are. Jesus, you're everything we'll ever need. You're the great I am. You're the beginning. You're the end. You're the one who sees all things and has authority over everything. So God, I ask for every single person in this room, Lord, that they would know you in truth. God, that they would submit their circumstances and relationships to you that they would trust you in everything that you do. And God, that you would set within their souls a sense of serenity in the sovereignty of your good grace. God, that you are over everything. 
God, I pray this church would know how much you love them and how wonderful and how powerful you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, you can be seated. Now, next we're going to read chapters 2 and 3, but we've got a number of guys that you're familiar with that are going to read these seven letters to these seven churches, and then we're going to pray the truth of these words into our lives this morning. So Pastor Joe is first going to come and read the letter written to the church at Ephesus. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Ephesus. This is the message from the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven gold lampstands. I know all the things you do. I have seen your hard work and your patient endurance. I know you don't tolerate evil people. You ex examine the claims of those who say they are apostles, but are not. You have discovered they are liars. You have patiently suffered for me without quitting. But I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as much as you did at first. Look how far you have fallen. Turn back to me and do the works you did at first. If you don't repent, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place among the churches. But this is in your favor. You hate the evil deeds of the Nicolaitans just as I do. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. To everyone who is victorious, I will give fruit from the tree of life in the paradise of God. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Smyrna. This is the message from the one who is the first and the last, who was dead but is now alive. I know about your suffering and your poverty, but you are rich. I know the blasphemy of those opposing you. They say they are Jews, but they are not because their synagogue belongs to Satan. Don't be afraid of what you are about to suffer. The devil will throw some of you into prison to test you. You will suffer for 10 days. But if you remain faithful, even when facing death, I will give you the crown of life. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. Whoever is victorious will not be harmed by the second death. This is the letter to the angel at the church in Pergamum. This is the message from the one with the sharp two-edged sword. I know that you live in the city where Satan has his throne, yet you have remained loyal to me. You refused to deny me even when Antipas, my faithful witness, was martyred among you there in Satan's city. But I have a few complaints against you. You tolerate some among you whose teaching is like that of Balaam, who showed Balak how to trip up the people of Israel. He taught them to sin by eating food offered to idols and by committing sexual sin. In a similar way, you have some Nicolaitans among you who followed the same teaching. Repent of your sin, or I will come to you suddenly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. To everyone who is victorious, I will give some of the manna that has been hidden away in heaven, and I will give to each one a white stone, and on the stone will be engraved a new name that no one understands except the one who receives it. Write this letter to the angel of the church of Thyatira. This is the message from the Son of God whose eyes are like flames of fire, whose feet are like polished bronze. I know all the things you do. I have seen your love, your faith, your service, and your patient endurance. And I can see your constant improvement in all of these things. But I have this complaint against you. You are permitting the woman, that Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet, to lead my servants astray. She teaches them to commit sexual sin and to eat a food offered to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she does not want to turn away from her, her immortality. Therefore, I will throw her on a bed of suffering, and those who commit adultery with her will suffer greatly unless they repent and turn away from her evil deeds. 
I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am the one who searches out the thoughts and intentions of every person. And I will give to each of you whatever you deserve. But I also have a message for the rest of you in Thyatira who have not followed this false teaching, deeper truths as they call them, but the depths of Satan actually. I will ask nothing more of you except that you hold tightly to what you have come to what you have until I come. To all who are victorious, who obey me to the very end, to them I will give authority over all the nations. They will rule the nations with with an iron rod and smash them like clay pots. They will have the same authority I received from my Father, and I will also give them the morning star. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. Still with us? Okay. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Sardis. This is a message from the one who has the sevenfold spirit of God and the seven stars. I know all the things you do and that you have a reputation for being alive, but you're dead. And here's the two words for right now. Wake up! Strength Strengthen what little remains, for even what is left is almost dead. I find that your actions do not meet the requirements of my God. Go back to what you heard and believed at first. Hold to it firmly. Repent and turn to me again. If you do not wake up, I will come to you suddenly and unexpected as a thief. Yet there are some in the church in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes with evil. They'll walk with me in white, for they are worthy. All who are victorious will be clothed in white. I will never erase their names from the book of life. But I will announce before my Father and his angels that they're mine. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. Write this letter to the angel of the Church of Philadelphia. This is the message from the one who is holy and true, the one who has the key of David. What he opens, no one can close, and what he closes, no one can open. I know all the things you do, and I have opened a door for you that no one can close. You have little strength, yet you obey my word and did not deny me. Look, I will force those who belong to Satan's synagogue, those liars, who say they are Jews but are not, to come and bow down at your feet. They will acknowledge that you are the ones I love. Because you have obeyed my command to persevere, I will protect you from the great time of testing that will come upon the whole world to test those who belong to this world. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have, so that no one will take away your crown. All who are victorious, Uh, will become pillars in the temple of my God, and they will never have to leave it. And I will write on them the name of my God, and they will be citizens in the city of my God, the new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. Awesome. Seventh and finally, the church of Laodicea. Jesus shares these words to this seventh and final church. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Laodicea. This is the message from the one who is the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's new creation. I know all the things you do, that you're neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other, but since you are lukewarm, like lukewarm water, Neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. You say, I'm rich. I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. And you don't realize that you're wretched and miserable and poor, blind and naked. So I advise you to buy gold from me, gold that has been purified by fire. Then you will be rich. Also, buy white garments from me. So you will not be shamed by your nakedness and ointment for your eyes. So you will be able to see. I correct and discipline everyone I love. 
So be diligent. Turn from your indifference. Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. Those who are victorious will sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat with my father on his throne. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he's saying to the churches. That's not a fire hydrant. That's a whole fire truck of God's word. As you consider these letters that are written to these seven churches, we know from spending some time together that these churches were all located within miles of one another. They were all located on the, kind of like the same postal route. That's the main means of communication in that time frame. They were influential cities with influential churches. And in each letter, maybe you remember this, Jesus kind of follows a similar pattern as he speaks to them. You guys know this about me. I'm kind of like an addicted alliterator with my kids. They all start with the first name with the letter L. Well, in each of these letters, you see Jesus identify the church, give somewhat of a characterization of himself that would relate exactly to what that church was going through. He'd bring some sorts of encouragement or commendation. For some, he would bring critique and complaint. He'd give command, he'd give counsel, caution, and then comfort. Why does Jesus do that? Because he loves his people. How many of you guys have ever met a kid or ever been a kid? One of you guys ever met them? How many would recognize that sometimes what they need most is encouragement and comfort? That sometimes maybe they've done something wrong or it was a reaction. You go, you know what? In this moment, I can see as their parent, yes, I could provide correction, but what they need in this moment is comfort. How many have ever been in a situation where you go, you know, I want to comfort that kid, but after I correct him, you know, because I love him. Because there's a dynamic here where this situation needs to be corrected. Let me see your eyes. Jesus knows you and loves you. He knows exactly what you're going through, and he knows best what you need most. But you are in a world that constantly preaches to you, constantly has content that's being shared with you, inundated with more information than any generation that's ever arrived on the, the face of this planet. And what I think we often need most is just to simply hear God's word. Hear God's word. Sometimes what I need from Jesus is correction. You know, you're wrong about this. God uses this amazing vessel called my wife to most often bring that illumination to me. But I love that. Greatest accountability partner I've ever had has been my spouse of these last 15 years. Sometimes I just need to know that he sees me. Like, did you read that in some of these churches? I see your works. I know Listen, you don't want to live for anyone else's eyes than Jesus. His perspective, his opinion of you. You need to know that Jesus loves you. And sometimes that love is corrective. In our generation, in our culture, things have been so defined and redefined that if you bring any kind of truth, sometimes it's seen as anti-love. One of the most gracious and good things God has ever done is to call sin, sin. Because sin is not bad because it's forbidden. Sin is forbidden because it's bad. It will destroy you. So God in his love, he's willing to bring correction. God's even willing through the, the ministry of his son, through the book of Revelation, to give commands, to give caution, to give warning. Here's what I want you to know as we close out this section of, God's, of reading of God's word. Jesus' love for his church is tender, but it's also thorough. It can, sometimes it can be tough and altogether holistic. You say, what do you mean by that? Jesus wants your heart, your head, and your hands. He, he wants you to worship him with body, soul, mind, and strength. He wants you. He wants you. And there's no better person to be led by and under the authority of than the one who has all power, all grace, all comfort, and all truth. 
I want us to stand together and I just want to pray over you as a church that any of these things that we see in these seven churches, these commands, these cautions, these comforts, these encouragements, that they would be owned by us as a church. Father, I thank you for this congregation. I thank you, Lord, that we can sit under the simple reading of your word. And God, I ask that your word would be like food to our very souls. Lord, that you would minister to us and God, that you would feed us your good word. Lord, I pray for every person in this room that there's some that are far from you. Jesus, by your spirit, you draw them close to you. And Lord, that you continue to move in spirit and in power. In Jesus' name, amen. As the band comes to play in just a moment, you can be seated. I want to highlight some of what we see in Revelation 4 and 5. Because Revelation 4 and 5, the scene transitions. We move from considering the person of Jesus in chapter 1. Chapters 2 and 3, looking at the people of Jesus, his church. And in chapters 4 and 5, the scene is what? It rhymes with Mevin, but starts with an H. Heaven. Heaven. He's in heaven. The perspective is heaven. And it's glorious. We were just in these two chapters two weeks ago, and we read them in their entirety. But in chapter 4, do you remember the central centerpiece of heaven rhymes with throne? Throne. Throne. What does that mean? The central centerpiece of heaven is that Jesus is in control. That he's sovereign. That he has his hand over everything. In fact, let me just read this to you out of Revelation chapter 4. Speaking of that which the angels say about Jesus, it comes from verse 11. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things and they exist because you created what you pleased. God, everything is to you, for you, and about you. You're worthy, you're worthy, you're worthy. In verse 8, it says that they say day after day, night after night, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, the one who always was, who is, and is still to come. And in chapter 5, as that chapter ends, with all the descriptions of the amazing things that are going on in the book of Revelation as a description of heaven, do you guys remember that like, winged eyed creature we showed you a few weeks ago of angels like that's no wonder they said do not fear when they showed up right like it's amazing all of things in heaven and on earth look to Jesus and say you're the one who's worthy in chapter 5 as we read last week I'll just look at verse 12 it says worthy is the lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing Every English teacher in the world would go, that is the longest run-on sentence I've ever seen, but that's what it's like. Man, Jesus, you're worthy of glory and honor and strength, power. Verse 13, it says, they sang, blessing and honor, glory and power belong to the one sitting on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. See, the scene in heaven in Revelation 4 and 5 is worship. When you recognize the authority, the supremacy, the power, the grace, the mercy, the love, the authority of God, you worship. And we'll do that this morning in song, but we know this together as a church. Worship is truly a lifestyle, right? You spell it A, B, C, maybe even D. Attitudes, belief, choices, and decisions. That's how you evidence what you worship. Like when we're gathered together to just kind of bubbles up and pops out in song, but attitude shows what we worship, what we believe, the choices we make, the decisions. That's where we describe and ascribe worth to something greater than ourselves. And so this morning, as we close, we're going to pick up Revelation in mid-August. We'll pick up chapter 6, take one chapter a week all the way through chapter 19, We'll see how a God of love and mercy is also a God of justice and righteousness. It's going to be a phenomenal series this fall. But as we close this series out this morning, let's be reminded of how amazing and how worthy Jesus is of our very lives. Like when you get to heaven, that's all that John sees in chapter 4 and 5. There's a throne and everyone around him is worshiping 
the risen, awesome Savior. So this morning, let's stand together. Let me pray for us, and we're going to continue to do that, to simply worship Jesus. Jesus loves church. He loves you. He loves when we gather together to worship. He loves when we group together to connect. And he loves when we go to make disciples and see others come to know Jesus. He is all about that agenda. So may we, as his people, be all about him. Amen?